everybody, I'm Nick, and in this video I want to show you what is the fastest way to loop in C Sharp. And in this video, we're going to focus into practical ways of doing it. We're not going to hack the memory, we're not going to use pointers or any fancy things. We're going to see every looping approach that I think is acceptable to use in a real application. Now, does this thing really matter? Well, except for one case, not really. This is more of a fun video just so you are aware of how .NET and C Sharp is performing when you're looping around structures. So just treat this as a bit of a fun video. Maybe you're curious, maybe there is a very advanced way to loop as well, which I will show you in this video. So let's take a look at that. If you like that of content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe for more training. Check out my courses on domtrain.com. Okay, so let me show what I have here. I have a .NET 9 application and all I have is this program.cs, nothing else, because all we're going to do in this video is just talk about the approaches and run some benchmarks. I want to do this for 10 million items. And of course, maybe you are looping for these high uh, number counts or maybe not, but it will give us a good idea on how different looping sizes perform. Now I should point out that in this video, I'm going to focus on lists only. That is because it is the most common structure you will be using in your .NET applications. At least that's the one I've seen most people use, but everything you see here applies to things like arrays, read-only lists, and any other structure. I Renewables can be a bit more complicated because of how you can yield return some things. But if you want to see a video on that topic, leave a comment down below and I'm more than happy to make that. Now, I've already installed benchmark.net, so I'm going to go straight into creating my benchmark class. And I care about the memory of this benchmark, so I'm going to add a memory diagnoser. And I'm also going to add the sample data. Now, the data will go as follows. We have a setup method over here for all our tests. And then we have a random class with a, just a random number as a seed. And then we're going to add all of these items into the list. But what are we adding? We're adding 1 million. And actually, just to show you it is 1 million, I'm going to use this syntax instead. So 1 million uh, strings into this list. So this is a list of strings because I don't want to use an integer because integers can be uh, optimized in loops in a certain way. And all I'm doing is I'm using the random.next method to get a next random integer. Uh, and I'm doing this with a seed because I want to have a deterministic random generation. So all of my benchmarks have the exact same set of data and then I'm using to string to add it into the list. Now, the first type of loop I'm going to have is the most common type of loop. It is a for loop. Now, a few things I want to mention. First, because I don't want the operation just to be optimized away by the compiler or the JIT, I'm actually using the result here as a return type to make sure that this result is not going anywhere and I do have the looping happening. And then I'm pulling the count computation out of the loop this will give us just a tiny, small performance boost, but that's about it. And then I'm just getting the value out of the list and I'm just returning it using an indexer. And that's about it. Then the second one, as you might expect, is the for each loop. Now the for each loop, way easier to write. You don't need to have the count. All that will be done for us. And then you just say for each and you return it very straightforward. And then you have, because this is a list, you have the for each method of the list, which many people, including myself in the past, thought that it is a link method, but it is not. As you can see over here, this looks like this. You just have the list dot for each. And yeah, it does look like a link method. But if we go in here, we're going to see that it is not a link method. It is part of list. And then after for each, I want to just see how the more low level loops perform. So first, that would be at the while loop, for example. We have the i up here while the i is less than the size. Then we keep it iterating. We're adding one on the i and then return it. Again, we take the size out of the loop. And then I'm also going to have the do while, which is a bit of a different way to loop. And you don't really see do while loops that often. They can be very convenient, but I haven't seen one in a real environment in a very, very long time. Again, however, it is an option. So here we go. And one you might not expect that is certainly possible in C Sharp is actually using the go to keyword. So what's happening here? Well, we're setting a label here saying that this is the start of well, I want to go back into my looping mechanism. And then I say if i is less than size, then do your thing plus plus and then go to start. So this will make it jump to the label called start. So here and then do the check again, down here, down here, down here. And I did say in the beginning of the video, these are all examples you can practically use in your applications. This one, uh, don't use it unless you want the rest of your team to hate you. But it is a very good thing to know that the go to keyword exists and it can make some situations easier to write for your own personal use outside of anyone else's code. And for now, this is where I want to leave all of these solutions. So all I'm going to do is go to the program.cs and say benchmark runner.run and say benchmarks. 
And that's that. And I'm going to go straight into running all of my benchmarks. Now, before I move on, I'd like to let you know we just launched a brand new course on Dome Train called Deep Dive in Domain Driven Design. And that course is a follow up to the existing Getting Started with Domain Driven Design by Amikai Mantenband. In this second course, Amikai goes beyond what he built in the first course and we build a more entire and complete system using DDD. DDD is one of the most popular ways to build software, especially in .NET, and it is a must for anyone who wants to learn how to use DDD. Now to celebrate the launch, the first 200 of you can use discount code DDD20 to get 20% off on the deep dive course. These do go fast, so do not miss this opportunity to invest in your future. Now back to the video. Okay, so results are back. Let's see what we have here. So as you can see, basically they all perform about the same. They're all optimized by the JIT and the compiler in effectively what is the same way. Every difference you see here is within margin of error from an execution to execution basis except for the for each method, which has some memory allocation because we are allocating that closure. And it's also the slowest by quite the margin is around three to four times slower. So what I would say in general is don't use the for each method, but in terms of all the other ones, they will be optimized to around the same way. There used to be a time where for each, the for each loop was less efficient than the for loop. Those days are gone. And as you can see, these are .NET 9 results. So they're not even current, they're future results. And they're really, really good. But I do want to add a single extra method. And I've talked about it in the past. And that method is all about if you really need to squeeze some extra performance in some particular situation, you can get a minimal reduction in sizes like this by doing the following. I'm going to have the benchmark and I'm going to say public string I'm going to say mystery and I'm going to rename that in a second. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have the result again, string.empty. Then I'm also going to get the size to give it the best performance you can possibly have. And by the way, I should point out, if you want to test any of these on your own, the entire code for this benchmark is in the description down below, free to get. You can change it to an integer, you can change it to a complicated type. Just run this on your own and see what you can get out of it. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the span behind the list because lists in C sharp are actually backed, as you can see over here, by an internal array, which you can't access. I can't just go and say uh, dot underscore items. That's just impossible. However, there is a method that allows me to do that. It's called collections marshall dot as span and this will give me access to the span behind the list if i go to the as span method as you can see it has a bunch of uh, things going on but the most important is it gets a reference to that array and then it creates a span out of it and that will make it more efficient to operate on the list this, however, does mean that if anything changes to that array as you're looping around it, dodgy things can happen. So try to have an array that is unlikely to change while you're looping around it. And obviously be careful when you change it. Yeah, okay, you can change a value, but don't resize, don't, you know, you can break things if you do this. And that's why I think you should be a bit careful doing it. But once you do, you can complete the rest of the method. I'm going to call that span. And now, if I run these benchmarks again, let's see what we get. Okay, so results are back. And as you can see, performance on the span version is almost twice as fast as any of the other efficient ones and many times faster than the for each method on the list. So should you go ahead and replace everything with the span method? Of course not. But if you know what you're doing and you have a situation where it makes sense for you to use that, that's a very good way to do it. In fact, Microsoft is doing it in many scenarios. That's why they made that method. So those are all the methods I think you should use. But if you know any others that we can have here, please leave them in the comments down below and let everyone know what we should be using. But now I want to from you. What do you think is the best way to do it? This is just for for each, maybe the for each method, even if it's inefficient, it just reads nicely. And to be fair, it is the shortest one out of everything. So which one should we be using? Leave a comment down below, let me know. Well, that's all I had for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. And as always, keep coding.